basically, so every time you stop in a pad, stop at a site, you have five fields of view. So that could be, um, you know, in an avocado scenario, you could be a side of the tree. So this this side of the tree is one field of view. The other side of the tree is another field of view. The inside of the tree is a field of view. The side of the next tree is a field of view. Um, or for citrus, I tend to make a field of view a lot of times the fruit itself. Um, and so if you see a pest on that field of view, that would count as one. So that sort of calibrates for some of the pests that are more, I guess, swarming pests or plague pests where you can have, say, a lot of loopers in one field of view, but you wouldn't write it down as 30 loopers, you'd still write it down as one. Um, so that basically, because you, otherwise it would look like you have really huge, you have to go out and treat straight away for these loopers, even though it's only just affected this one side of this tree. So that's why we use a field of view method. And so a lot of um, pest scouting guides, a lot of um, resources spit out by the government and, and other um, people who, who make those sorts of resources, um, they always express trigger points and fields of view. So this gives you a bit of background on where if you are able to use those guides or have access to those guides, there's pretty good ones for a lot of um, horticultural commodities. Um, it gives you some background on how to come to that percentage. So I've got the example here. And um, so if three loopers are found in one field of view, it's still only recorded as one. So if you have a, a block with 30, or oh, sorry, six sites, and each site has five fields of view, um, and three of those fields of views have loopers, it will come out to be expressed as 10%. Um, so, and here on the side, I've got a graph that um, was sort of uh, produced based on percentages of um, different pests um, using the threshold method. So, once you've got that data, you have a lot of power, um, especially when you've been collecting it over a long time. So it doesn't just come into the short term um, trigger point, do I spray, do I not spray? It also comes into long term trends, getting an idea of, hold on, it's May. Um, what We have really high fruit spotting bug pressures in May. Um, do I need to be looking more for fruit spotting bug or um, so get, get once that being able to calculate these trends and and for your farm and yeah it can give you a lot of decision making power um, you know, patterns and and further you know be able to give detail to to your enterprise. So as always, there's advancements in technology and it, it applies to every facet of our lives. So that does <laughs> include pest monitoring. So one of the, um, the new advancements is GPS. So we're able um, to GPS, oh, can you see my mouse there? I don't know. Um, so- Yeah, we can, Emily. Okay. <laughs> so here we're able to see a GPS coordinate for Once it's recorded, that those GPS coordinates are um, tagged onto that particular pest where you recorded it, and then over time you can come up with heat maps. So this is this is a um, I guess archaic form of. So here we've got this is for fruit spotting bug for a farm, and um, what we've got here is um, basically. 5% um, well, sorry, five, five sites were found with fruit spotting bug. It was five fields of view were found with fruit spotting bug here. Oh, I'm just turned off. Oops, sorry. Um, I think. Yeah, no, that's okay, Emily. I've just turned your video off because the Wi-Fi was a bit wonky. 
Okay, fair enough. All right, cool. Um, okay, so here we've doing got... Doing a great uh, job. You could do a great <laughs> job. We, we just missed a tiny little bit at the beginning of this um, slide. Oh, okay. Do, if you need me to go back, let me know. <laughs> um, so here we've got um, recordings for where fruit spotting bug have been found according to its GPS coordinates. Um, so we, you can start to build heat maps on where the pressure is coming from. And that gives you, again, a better, um, more power in decision making. Should, if we're, you know, starting to calendar spray for fruit spotting bug, maybe we should only be calendar spraying this SH3 instead of, you know, PH2 over here because there's no point, because there's no pressure on that side of the farm. Um, so, which leads into my next point, um, if I can, doesn't seem to want to move, there we go, okay, so which brings me into the whole point of pest scouting, which is, um, or the main point of pest scouting, which is IPM, so a lot of my pest scouting, basically, I give numbers to a grower, and then I give a recommendation, and often it's a chemical recommendation, but when I, um, I give a recommendation, I bring together all the, the aspects of um, pest pressures, which isn't just, you know, what numbers are there, do we treat, do we not treat, um, to be able to make a good decision on what action to take on a pest, the, have to consider all of these points, which I will go through, like, um, so weather, so for example, if it's, you know, heating up or cooling down. Um, I'll use citrus as an example. So oriental mites and citrus, if it's hot and dry, you would might treat. Whereas if it's going to be overcast and wet and rainy in the next week, you probably consider holding off. Um, just as an example, soil moisture can also really affect mites. Um, it will affect um, disease populations. If the plants are water stressed, they often, um, mites will just go crazy on them. Um, and that's, that's across a couple of commodities, bananas, papayas, um, citrus. So keeping, keeping an eye on your water moisture, if, you've got, if you're having consistent mite problems, is it, could it, you know, what your soil moisture be affecting that? Um, and nutrition plays a, a pretty big role in, in pest dynamics as well. Um, overuse of nitrogen has been associated with um, mite issues across commodities. Um, you know, calcium and boron for cigatoka disease in um, bananas. So, um, you know, looking at that aspect of it as well is, is incredibly important. Um, and as, a, as an agronomist, pest scouting is the bulk of what I do, but I will always look over a grower's nutrition program. I'll go, and I will, as I'm going through the paddock, I, I'm aware of all these symptoms and, and keeping this in mind. Um, one of the really big things is surrounding vegetation. So, um, for example, if you've got fruit spotting bug issues, um, they're most likely to be coming out of the scrub or if you've, you know, an avocado farm, you've got a neighbouring mango farm that doesn't spray a lot, it could be coming from there. And so I've put in here a slash in my own orchard. So um, this is where I wanted to bring in things like mohawks. Um, so that will affect the pest pressures. That's an IPM consideration if you're leaving, um, you know, grass seed for the, for the predatory mites to um, thrive on, move, and that, that can reduce your pest pressure by a certain percentage. Um, uh, equipment is a big one, like sprayers, are they calibrated properly? Because um, a lot of, it can happen that growers are, are spraying for mites or oh, anything, of fungal diseases, and they're not getting really great coverage and they're scratching their heads going, why, why is the pressure so high? Um, and it could just be that the, the simple thing that this sprayer isn't quite calibrated properly. Um, and that's probably one of the, the biggest cost savings is to just get, get the, the sprayer calibrated properly. 
um, to reduce juice the amount of sprays you're putting on. Um, and I'll do a smooth little segue here um, into Paul's talk. <laughs> How do insects um, and other ben like beneficials or um, how do they interact with the pests that you're concerned about? Um, so a quick summary, um, why, why we need to do pest scouting. Um, basically, data, data, data. Um, we need to be able to create numbers in order to be able to compare things and um, take some level of emotional um, Level, so emotional decision making out of the the equation. Um, so using the threshold method, um, I know I went through it fairly quickly, but it, worth having a practice of um, because that will give you access to a whole lot of resources. Um, uh, Emily, we had a question here about yeah. um, scouting. Do you record beneficial populations as well? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, because, I mean, they, they are, come, you want to be able to compare beneficials at different times. Like, for example, uh, if you're seeing, uh, I, well, I always find that I get the greatest percentage of assassin bugs just after flowering and which is great because it provides a, a bit of a buffer for things like fruit spotting bugs moving in but it also means that they're probably feeding on things like pollinators. And it just gives you a bit of information on, on how many there are out there. Um, it gives you the ability to compare, compare it over time, like through, across blocks and across, across times. Um, it, and just gives you a bit of power in that sense. Um, yeah, so, yeah, well, and the whole point, the, the main, um, point of all of this record keeping and decision making is to bring an IPM strategy to your farm. So you're not relying wholly on chemicals. You're looking at everything. You can compare different things that you're doing. Does this bring down the pressure? Because using a consistent um, method to, to record um, pest pressures means that you yeah you have the power to trial different things um and yeah implement an ipm strategy into your farm uh emily is does anyone else have a question for emily stephen you've unmuted we've got a couple of questions in the chat here oh yeah yeah so uh, um I'll let you... yeah you go you go lindsay so we've got a question here from Tony. What determines the number of sites you will do in a block? Um, that's a really good question. So I, <laughs> I, I try to do, it will depend on the crop and the planting density, um, the thickness of the trees. Um, for example, in citrus, I try to do a site every hectare at least. Um, with mangoes or something like that, it's a little bit more extensive. You can do one side every couple of hectares. Um, but it comes, um, here I am talking about how important numbers are, but it comes down to gut feeling. Do you feel like you've um, got a good spread of your farm, a representative number of trees in order to um, make decisions? So if, if you feel like you haven't got enough information to make a decision, then keep it from few more um, sites in. I'm sorry, that probably didn't answer the question very well, but yeah, it does come down to gut feeling and yeah, do you feel like you've created a representative sample? Um, so Emily, another question is, what are the economic thresholds for pests? Well, for example, Monolepta in avocados. <laughs> so monolepta's are quite a, a, a particularly difficult one. Um, I wouldn't often use thresholds for monolepta's because they move quickly. Um, so basically because they're a swarming pest, it's all about concentrating your spray on the swarm. Um, but economic, I know, well, every commodity has its own 
different guide to economic thresholds. I know, if, for example, Citrus has a really good um, resource called the Citrus Pest and their Natural Enemies. I think that's that's what it's called. Um, and that has economic thresholds um, listed. Of, of course, um, use this with a grain of salt because they are um, area specific. Um, and for example, North Queensland might have different economic thresholds to say Bundaberg, but um, I know the BMP for avocados has some economic thresholds in it, um, some trigger points. Um, so yeah, they are, are listed and obviously this is the, the method used or accepted by the, the government departments and this is what they've created their economic thresholds on. So um, a lot of the government departments put out their own separate resources. Um, but of course, yeah, it's all about gathering information for your own farm. Because as I said, it take everything with a grain of salt. So if, you, if you're gathering numbers and data, it means that, you know, later on you said, oh, um, I didn't treat when flooded's got to 10% last time. Um, and they became a really big problem and caused a fair bit of damage. So I'm going to treat at 10% this time. Um, so it is, it can be a long-term um, building um, activity. Um, Emily, uh, Renee Liddell from, um, has got a question regarding, uh, wondering if you could quickly run through the threshold method again. Uh, she, threshold, she... oh yeah, okay. So um, I did go through it fairly quickly. Um, so basically, um, at each site you go to, you have five fields of view. So a field of view could be the side of a tree. Um, it could be a piece of fruit, depending on what you're looking at. Um, it could be the inside of a tree. Um, but basically where you're looking, you don't want to move your head. I mean, obviously, if you need to move your head to look very closely at you know, your, your field of view, you can, but the idea is it's just where you're looking. You don't want to look, um, you, you know, look, you wouldn't use a whole tree as a field of view. Um, so yeah, as I said, that just calibrates for things like loopers where you might have a mass of loopers in a small area. So if you're counting single loopers, it look like you've got a massive issue where the reality is it's concentrated to a small area. So, um, five fields of view per site um, and you know so you record how many fields of view have it have a pest present and then you record that as a percentage of fields of view with this pest present so the example is lupus um, three fields of view have lupus present there were 30 fields of view in total so there are 10% would be how you express that. Thanks, Emily. Um, and there's a comment there from Tony. He's just sent it through to the chat box. So what we'll do, Emily, thank you very much you. for doing that presentation. And I understand it's very challenging with Wi-Fi. Um, so what we'll do now is we'll just do a handover to, um, to, Paul, who's our next presenter from Bugs to Bugs. So, but while we're doing that, while we're just getting set up, um, I'd just like to um, congratulate those who are first time Zoom users. It's always a challenge when you're trying something new and different. And for actually for both Paul and Emily, this is the new experience presenting on Zoom. So Emily, you did a great job. Thank you very much. Thank and you. now we'll hand it over to Paul. So, Paul, you have to, I think you have to stop. Oh, how do we do this? <laughs> yeah, so, Emily, if you sh stop sharing screen, yep, and then, Paul, you should be able to start. Great. And that's Lindsay. He's tech support. He's my colleague in Townsville. <laughs> He's like a hipster. <laughs> oh, good. Sorry. I take offence to that, Michelle. <laughs> I just feel so old when I talk to Lindsay. <laughs> Okay, Paul, we can see your screen, so that's great. Oh, great, thank you. Um, yeah, thanks, Emily. Um, that's a good presentation, and, and, and it brings both our topics together. Um, obviously, there will be a little bit of crossover because um, dealing with 
beneficials and, and um, monitoring crops is pretty much synonymous with each other. Um, yeah, look, just to give a quick a brief rundown about myself, I've been involved in biocontrol for the last 30 years. Um, well, I had my business um, started, yeah, pretty much started out monitoring and then started um, mass rearing beneficial predatory mites, uh, namely, namely Persimilis, and then moved on to a project with Bugs of Bugs um, for the silverleaf whitefly, Eremiceros hayati. Um, Sort of roughly about three, four years ago, um, I then with sort of got to, a team of us got together and merged. Um, I merged my business with Bugs for Bugs, and um, well, four of us from different sort of industries come together. Since then, Bugs for Bugs is, is really starting to take off, and and I guess it's we're still we're still small relative to the whole turnover of industry so forth, but the business is, um, we're just in that streamline of growing extremely fast. And just recently, uh, we've had an interest come in from Europe, Biobest, and they're a significant um, beneficial producer, the second largest in the world, just behind uh, Coppets. And um, that's pretty much um, boosted the, the game a bit more with beneficial insects. And um, that's enabled us to bring in um, new technologies, new intellectual properties to help us improve and produce bugs. So, yeah, so, um, yeah, so tonight I'm just going to run through, it's pretty, pretty much a pictorial, different beneficials we use um, and how we might be able to use this with different industries in the main focus, I guess, will be Queensland. And, um, yeah, I'll just give a bit of a rundown of the different beneficials we deal with. So, um, yeah, so this is um, the first, this is probably one of the stars tonight is the uh, lacewing and Bugs Bugs produces um, quantities of eggs and larvae to be, to be released into onto farms. Um, I'll go on a bit more detail about lace wings, but um, we're going to see significant growth with this particular fellow. It's already out in big numbers, and we're working on the premise of turbo boosting beneficial numbers in crops to to enhance fire control. And um, it's quite exciting where the future's going to go with um, beneficial insects. Yeah, so so just briefly, um, like so, it's going to be a lot of pictures tonight, so I'll get the writing part out of the way. So. Um, yeah, so yeah, basically we mass rare beneficial what we call arthropods, both insects and mites for biological pest control. Um, so in our case, so I guess part of my job is to, I, I established pretty much um, go back 30 years in the strawberry industry where IPM was never used. Pretty much I was very much cottage industry. And it was part, part of my job was to try and get an IPM program set up in strawberries. And um, I'd have to say today probably we're involved in all states of Australia and pretty much, I dare say, about 95% of the strawberry industry now uses beneficial insects as their primary means of controlling pests, particularly mites and thrips. So, and, and I guess a lot of my job is to go into new crops and to try and develop IPM programs. And without going too much detail, the definition of um, IPM, all I can say, IPM is extremely integrated pest management, is very dynamic changes a lot, it requires a lot of flexibility um, and that's key for monitoring um, and is very unique. So each, each farm doesn't, it could be the same crop, next door neighbour may have different um, levels of pests that do, requires different amounts of beneficial insects or different, amount, different types of control to achieve um, good uh, pest control. So yeah, so identifying pests, when I go to a farm, identifying pests is critical. Next, we've got to match that pest with beneficial control agent. Most in nature, most pests, majority of pests do have beneficial that controls it. Now, the degree of control varies. Uh, tonight, we mentioned monolepta beetle, very difficult to control with, a, with um, bio control at the level where they're swarming. So really, it's got to go back to where they are, where they originate from. And the example of them, it could be, it could be a nematode, it could be a fungus, or it could be some other beneficial insect that controls them. So you have to have some knowledge of that pest to be able to identify how to how to control it and where to control it.
critical to a good IPM program. Uh, releasing, yeah, so the next part is releasing the beneficials on the farms, it's identifying the pests and then releasing it. Um, I'll briefly, we've been doing a lot of work. Um, most traditionally releasing has been done manually, but there's been a surge because of the um, industries we're involved in. There's become a, um, a growth industry in releasing beneficials. And it's one operator, mainly Nathan Roy of Green Oil Products. Um, a few growers may have experienced his services. He uses a drone now to, to spread beneficials. We've done a lot of research with it and we're finding results are excellent. And the great thing about use of drones and that it actually sort of simulates the way we're dealing, I guess, taking a step back, we're dealing with beneficials that already exist in the field. So basically what we're trying to do is trying to enhance uh, control by releasing these beneficials um, earlier than say when the population, pest population start to climb. So using the drones really is a great form of simulating um, natural movement of beneficials into the blocks. We're just trying to cheat a bit with nature by bringing these bugs in say for strawberries, the predatory, predatory mites in before the two, two spotted mites take off and it's been extremely effective and we're going to see a lot more of this in the future. Um, Hi, uh, cool yeah. to interrupt. Sorry to interrupt you. Um, sure. we, we can just see a list of text. Is that what we're looking at? Moment, yeah. Sorry, Michelle. Yeah. I'll, I'll get no, out. No. Yeah. No, that's okay. I just had to check. Yeah. No, that's no problem. So, um, okay. yeah, so we'll move through this pretty quickly. No, no. No, it's very interesting. I'm no, just no problem. hoping. <laughs> Maybe I'll talk too much. <laughs> no, no, not at all. Not at all. <laughs> Finally, um, with 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 um, bugs of bugs, critical is monitoring, and and Emily's explained the details of monitoring. How important monitoring is, is critical. Very, very important that there's operators in bugs of bugs are not just growing bugs, but they're actually out in the field working with people like Emily. We, we actually have a very good relationship with Paddle Grail Services. And in fact, um, one of the managers is an ex-employee of Bugs of Bugs. So the, the crossover, the connection and that with, um, with agronomists is vital to the success of, of, of IPM. Um, yeah, we'll talk about decisions too. I'll leave that because Emily sort of went into details. Now, I'm just gonna run through some, just out of interest, I'm gonna just run through some of the products we are dealing with and just quickly sort of run down what they're doing and they could be used for particular operations that I know it's quite a vast variety of operations tonight. Hopefully you might see something there that might be of interest to you. Um, again, if you're interested, further interest, um, bugs are bugs, just go to the website and if you wanna go into more detail, these beneficials, there's, some, there's an excellent web website which gives a lot of details in the different biocontrol products we have. So yeah, probably one of the first um, products that Bugs of Bugs developed was a phytos and that's um, for red scale control. Um, used a lot in the citrus industry. It's probably a classic case of most products we use, um, Bugs of Bugs tend to be a growth product. Um, a phytos is one that's actually diminished because of um, you know, a lot of times the chemistry is a blame for a lot of the pest problems. In this case, chem chemistry has come in and it's cleaned up a lot of the red scale problems. Not to say that aphytus won't be an important beneficial in the future, because over time, chemistry is not perfect. Over time, resistance will develop and more than likely red scale will come back into the system again and growers will probably be um, looking at the use of aphytus as a biocontrol agent for red scale. But, um, very good. Beneficial. Um, Trichogramma are very powerful little parasites. They occur a lot in nature. Um, we produce two types, uh, Trichogramma proteosum, primarily for Heliophis. Um, I noticed Emily mentioned lupus. It's actually very good on lupus. Great little par parasites. Um, they occur naturally in good numbers. Um, we use them quite a lot in sweet corn, tomatoes and crops like that. And they are so good, actually, they'll, they'll, they'll bring about, you know, over time, they'll bring, out, bring about 100% control of, um, paras of eggs, which obviously is excellent because just briefly, modern IPM virtually works on zero pest damage thresholds now. Well, that's the, the, that's the pressures we have in producing produce. And if you want a bug that 
totally 100% controls um, pests, potentially the trichogramma would be the case. The other one, there's quite a different, quite a lot of different species of trichogram. The other one we're using is carveray, and it's quite effective on uh, light brown apple moth and codling moth. Proteosin is also, we're doing a bit of work with diamondback moth control because there are some districts that are having severe diamondback moth issues. And it's one I'm sort of keen to do further work on in biocontrol diamondback moth eggs. Um, I mentioned Aromosaurus hayati before, highly, very, very successful silver leaf white fly control. It was brought out 10 or so years, probably not longer than that, 15 years ago, Syro from the USA, Texas. It actually comes from Afghanistan originally. Um, great parasite for silver leaf white fly. Silver leaf white fly decimated in horticulture quite a few, um, you know, probably even three, four years ago and beyond, you know, in cotton, um, various field crops. Um, and occurs quite good, quite well in, in naturally. And I'd have to say it's it's had a lot to do with reducing the pressure of silver leaf white fly. But it's one that from a releasing point of view still is an immense benefit for the clients to release Hayati to bring about early biocontrol that pest before it gets out of hand. Um, yeah, and then a colleague um, for Mactrix, the trichogram at Audia, sorry. It's uh, very powerful in the macadamia industry for nut borer. When I first started my monitoring, this species of come from South Africa, I believe. Um, it did not exist, and we had horrific periods of um, nut borer damage in the macadamias, and that was post probably 15, 20 years ago. Since this parasite's come in, it's really taken a good, strong control of macadamia nut borer, classic IPM product that's given fantastic results. Um, interesting, as Emily talked about, um, now there are some pests that are very difficult to control, and I'd have to put my hand up and say one of them would be fruit spotting bug. And I don't envy um, anyone who can who can come about with a, a, a good biocontrol of fruit spotting bugs going to do very well. There are parasites out there. Um, as I say, you know, no system's perfect. This this guy here in the status, again, um, Mass Red at uh, Bioresources, uh, Richard Hewellen, is very useful, but um, the light that comes back to damage threshold, the, you sort of need that chemistry to help reduce some um, spotting bug issues so love to see something come through in the future with fruit spotting bug control it's a very difficult one but at least we do have some animals to help control it biologically um, aphids are a problem and there's a series of parasites aphidia cephalinus very good for aphid control um, and yeah and they form a critical role in controlling aphids and they can be brought in they come in naturally and also can be brought in commercially. Um, yeah, so, so the parasites. So the other group of animals we mass rare are the predatory ladybirds in particular. Um, prior to the discussion tonight, we discussed that there's massive problems with um, mealybugs and probably the main animal for mealybug control, biocontrol, and there's this new, there's a species getting around solenapsis um, mealybug. And major problem in cotton, see the macadamias, a lot of crops. But this guy here, he'll, he'll um, bring about um, quite powerful little cryptolemus to be your number one alpha ladybird for the control of mealybugs. Very good. And um, it's one that's one of the main products that um, Bugs of Bugs produces. Not easy growing bugs, and this one's quite a difficult one to grow. Um, so quite often we have supply problems with it but um, with new technologies and that coming through, we're hoping to be able to produce a lot more. And we do see there's going to be considerable demand for these uh, millibugs. They're just becoming more and more of a problem as time each year progresses. Colochorus, that's a classic uh, scale, hard scale ladybird. Um, it's been, been around, it's been useful in citrus. We see it in quite a few industries. Very good predator. We use it in some nursery situations to help with scale control particularly red scales or white louse scales, um, a lot of hard-shelled scales, quite, quite, a, quite a useful um, 
ladybird. Generally, ladybirds don't bring about total control, but cryptolemus would be a classic one which would bring about total control of mealybugs. Lace wings, I mentioned lace wings before. Um, it's one that we're doing some more work with Europe. They're using a lot of them. We're really starting to ramp up our production. Lace wings feed on everything. Aphids, thrips, mites, the whole lot. They'll eat up to 60 aphids an hour. They're incredible, amazing predator. And um, we've only just, because it, it's one of those ones you see in nature a lot and you, you sort of think, well, we don't really need them, but we're just finding now by turbo boosting crops um, by putting in more later birds in earlier, we're, we're confident we're gonna bring about a lot quicker by control. And the great thing about these there, they, they just, non-specific to just go for any particularly soft-bodied um, pests and, and obviously if the predator got in their way they'd probably try and tackle them as well but in general they're very much um, chasing the bad guys and um, it's one that we're really starting to put a lot of work in and we see it as a vital beneficial for a lot of crops particularly outside crops. Um, Paul just got a question here yeah. um, about rating sulfaloxor as a chemical control for S FSB. Is it IPM compatible? Pretty challenging since endosulfan was banned. Oh, gee, is that um, sulfoxaflor, a chemical? Sulfoxaflor. Sulfoxaflor, yes. Oh, what's a common, sorry, I'm, I'm not got a bit of, I know the chemical, I just got a bit of a mental blank on it because there's quite a few different products of that sort of, is that transformed? That's transformed, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, look, it is, it's a, look, a lot, there's no purpose, look, there's a handful of products of chemistry that um, are, you call them perfect chemicals, they don't affect beneficials. Most your chemicals are going to be um, slightly uh, toxic or slightly toxic. Transformed, so, uh, so toxic floor, is um, quite hard on your lace wings and your ladybirds, but very soft on your predatory mites. So I guess, and going back to Emily, the decision making, if you do choose to use those products, um, you say, okay, we're gonna take out um, our ladybirds and we're gonna preserve our predators. So generally speaking, and, and we could talk all night, generally speaking, um, when using beneficials, it's critical that we look at what products we are using. So if that one in particular, soft on soft on predatory mites and some beneficials, very hard on others. And Aureus, I've just brought up then, pirate bugs, another very useful predator, quite hard on them. So yeah, so it, there is a, look, it, there is a fair bit of skill set involved in IPM. I said, it's, as I said before, it's very dynamic, flexible and unique. And that comes down to your choice of chemistry. Um, yeah, so I just showed that I'll, I'll keep moving. Um, Aureus, another beneficial that we produce, they're very good. Um, I'll just show you we, we, now we're always introducing new beneficials, mass rearing. This has been a real, this similar to the um, lace wings, this one's been a bit of a coup for bugs for bugs. It's called a three banded ladybird. And we, we originally just thought it was just useful on aphids, but we also found it to be extremely useful on, on mealybugs as well, because so mealybugs seem to be becoming more of a problem. And um, it's another one we produce, and, it, 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 and it, it's a great one. It, it can get like plagues of them, which is incredible, you know, a bit like monoleptors, but they don't do the damage. And it's amazing. They'll keep strips under control, psyllids. Um, there, there is... Um, there's a threat of that potato salad. Um, I believe they'd have to play an important biocontrol role in pests like that in, in case they do come across to the eastern states of Australia. So, yeah, look, all I'm saying is that we are continuously bringing in new products all the time. And this is a, one problem. That our two stars at the moment would be the ladybirds, this three-banded ladybird, and the, um, the lace wings, which we've had for a long time. Um, I'll briefly run through... So the three main, we've got parasites, ladybirds, predatory mites. I'm just going to talk about the insects and the mites, predatory mites, because we all have, also have a lot of other products with um, fruit fly control and so forth. So predatory mites, we have various, there's various types in the industry. Cucumerous, they're, they're a good threat predator. Um, then we've got, there are various um, Predatory mites for mites, there's Tiflodrome, Soxentalis, that's money for apple industry. Californicus, that's a 
that's what you call it. We call him. He's a bit of a star. We call him a polyphagus. He pretty much feeds on everything. Actually, found he's quite useful in broad might too. But you got to. They've got to be released in quite good numbers. We found um, useful in bananas for the banana mite, robbery mite. Um, yeah, so that's one we sort of we do quite a lot. Also, two spotted mite. Um, Hyperaspis, it's, it's one of your soil dwelling mites, very good for um, fungus gnats and for dealing with um, strip pupae and other, other sort of soft shell pests that are in the soil. Uh, Montarensis, uh, very good for silverleaf whitefly. Thrips, broad mites. Um, it's it's another one that's really grown a lot over the years, and um, we're finding it's very very useful predatory mite. And finally, Persimilis, which is probably the most um, used for two spotted mite and very aggressive predator. Um, as you can see, we well, see from Montarensis, they'll take on anything two or three times its size and have no trouble cleaning them up. Um, yeah, so. Yeah. I can, do you want me to, it, I see the time starting to move on a bit, Michelle. Yeah. I'm quite happy to finish up now. I think I've sort of shown a bit of bugs of bugs. Yeah, um, no, we are running a bit short on time, but it's very interesting. We've got some questions. So you Sure. Well, I'm going to finish there and um, I'll take some quest questions. Okay, so this question is regarding the current drought. How are the current dry conditions impacting pests and beneficials? Good question. It's going to be interesting because um, it, it could uh, it, it it could go two ways. It could mean that your levels of pests and beneficials are going to be obviously affected by the drought, the numbers, or it could mean that irrigated crops in amongst dry areas could be are going to be a major refuge for pests. And if it's not managed prop, if well, I shouldn't shouldn't say it sounds condescending. If it's not, if it's managed, um, depending how it is managed, it's going to be how the predators' beneficials work. So if they use a lot of hard chemistry, could well be, it could get, the scales could tip towards um, high pest pressure because um, obviously they're looking for somewhere green and succulent to feed off. So potentially the drought could cause a problem now. I believe that was the case with aphids down south a couple of years ago. They had major aphid outbreaks as a result of the drought. The aphids were blowing in the wind until they found a, what you call an oasis or a bank of crop or a crop there where they could sort of land on and start um, extracting the um, sugars from the plant. So, yeah, good question. I can't really answer it. I'd suspect it's going to be a case of how you manage your crop and... Um, yeah, how you manage your crops is going to be the main thing. But I, I dare say that the impact of pests and pests is going to be still as bad, perhaps worse during the droughts. The okay, point. yes, yeah. it's pretty grim, isn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah. Paul, another question here. Which chemicals are less toxic for beneficials as we fight damaging myriads? Do you um, have natural predators for insects in the myriad? Viridiae family. Sorry, I might not have said that. Yeah, yeah, look, there are. Again, they're, they're, they're a major problem. Um, generalist predators. Look, I'd love to throw the lace wings in the mix to save large numbers of lace wings. Um, and and um, it's going to help attack the young stage nymphs. Um, specifics, there are specific parasitoids. I can't really say which ones there are. Um, chemistry, look, most of chemistry, look, we mentioned sulfoxyphor before, very good on mirrors, but can be very hard on some of your um, other beneficials, particularly your bugs, like your, your aureus and so forth. Um, look, it, 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 the, the answer is hard to answer. Um, the, look, we do have solutions for them, but, you know, we, and, but the tolerance for these pests is so low that you really... For strawberries in particular, you, you nearly have a zero tolerance for these particular pests. So you want to rely on your beneficials as much as possible. But if you do start to see fresh activity and some damage, well, you need to use some form of chemistry. There are they do use low rates of organophosphates. Um, there's a bit of controversy over that. Um, there are products such as Main Man, which are pretty soft, um, but they say the effects of it are not. Uh, as good as, say, products like Transform. Um, look, go to, go to the website, buy, 
Bugs and Bugs website, or you, know, you can go to the Coppets website and they list all the chemicals, pests and so forth, and they can give you a, a detail, a bit of a detail as to which products are safe and which ones aren't. Uh, it could, yeah, again, it's, um, it's hard to give specifics to these questions and I apologise for that amount of time we have. No, that's okay. Thank you very much, Paul. It was very, very interesting. Um, okay, we're going to do a very quick wrap up. Sorry, user error. I'm going to do a very quick wrap up. Just a bit of housekeeping. If you're looking for resources from on pests and disease, and additionally, um, the contact details for Paul and Emily, which we will circulate with their presentations. I have shared with you my presentation, and the reason I've done that uh, is because it's hugely informative, but actually because I had a little competition and I forgot to tell you about it at the beginning. So you see these lovely little pictures of bugs. If you can tell me the correct answer, the number of bugs that's in my presentation, I'll send you a gorgeous Growcom hat, Sport360 hat, and a stubby cooler. So you'll have a chance to let me know the number you came up with. Um, in the evaluation. So here's some resources which could be of, of use to you. Um, and um, when we circulate the presentation, all of these links will be active. For your diary, we've got two more Zoom sessions coming up. The next one is Rhiannon Robinson and Luke Griffin. I've got to, if I have his name incorrect there, sorry, from the Department of Agriculture and Fisheries. They will be talking about the use of bioreactors and a very interesting project that they are working on measuring nitrates in the soil profile. And then our last one for the year is Lean Nudson, our very own Lena Nudson from Growcom on the 27th of November, talking about climate resilience and preparedness. So um, that's it for me. Thank you very much, Emily and Paul, and everybody for participating. Um, and I hope you have a great evening. Thanks for joining us. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks, Michelle. Thank that was great. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks, guys. Good presentation. Thank you.